Good morning. For those of you that I have not met over the years, I'm Jeff McInnes, and I'm the school board attorney, and I'm uh, pleased to be here with you this morning to talk just a few minutes about Title IX. This is a presentation that could be done over a course of several hours if we really dove into all of the details. I've got 15 minutes, and so I'm obviously going to do a highlight for you, uh, which you will appreciate that we don't spend a couple of hours doing this. Um, I want to give you just a, a quick review of the actual law as it's implemented in the state of Florida. Title IX uh, appears under federal law, and in Florida it's implemented through the Florida Educational Equity Act, which is under section 1000.05 of the Florida statutes, and then there are state board of education rules that further implement the equity provisions that apply to uh, us in the uh, K-12 system. Under the statute, the Florida legislature has declared that discrimination on the basis of race, ethnicity, national origin, gender disability, or marital status against a student in the state system of public K-12 education is prohibited. No person in this state shall on the basis of race, ethnicity, national origin, gender, disability, or marital status be excluded from participating in or be denied the benefits of or be subjected to discrimination under the public K-12 education programs or activities. Now in particular, how does this apply to you and your athletic programs? The Florida law goes on to say that a public K-20 educational institution which operates or sponsors interscholastic, intercollegiate, club, or intramural athletics shall provide equal athletic opportunity for members of both genders. That part of the statute is further defined in the State Board of Education rules. And under those rules, gender equity in athletics at all levels of public education is defined as follows. Gender equity in athletics is the fair distribution of overall athletic opportunity and resources, and those are two very important things to remember, opportunity and resources, substantially proportionate to the enrollment of males and females so that no student athlete, coach, or athletic administrator is discriminated against in athletic programs on the basis of their gender. Accommodation of interest and abilities is another component of what the Department of Education looks at annually when they review every school district report for equity. The accommodation of interest and abilities is determined by the level of participation for male and female students and it shall be provided in numbers substantially proportionate to their enrollment in the institution. Mr. Johnson is going to come up in just a minute when I conclude and, and give you a three-pronged test that we go through as a public school district to determine our compliance. And when, when, when a school district is not in substantial compliance under this substantially proportionate standard, then the district is required to develop a corrective action plan so that we do get into compliance. And that is something that is monitored at the district level through the equity office on an annual basis. Now I want, to, I want to provide information to you this morning that is practical and helpful to you so that as you go back to your particular school, uh, you can apply some of the things we're talking about. So the way this is evaluated at the state level, the commissioner of education is required to determine whether equal opportunities are available in public school districts in this state. In order to do that, the Commissioner of Education receives from us an annual equity report, and that report outlines the following factors. It includes these elements. We have to report on the availability of equipment and supplies, and that they're being provided equitably to female and male teams. The scheduling of games and practices have to be provided as equal opportunity for those teams. Travel and per diem allowances. Opportunities to receive coaching have to be equitable for male and female teams. Locker rooms, practice facilities, and competitive facilities have to be of comparable quality for both male and female teams. Medical and training facilities and services 
have to be provided in an equitable manner. And, and each of these elements, the district has to report and check off annually that we're doing this. Publicity and promotion of male and female teams support has to be equal. And then any support services that are provided to your athletes have to be provided on an equitable basis. Now, in the event that a district does not comply and does not have a corrective action plan, then the, there are penalties that can be levied at the state level against the district and against the district as an entirety. Those penalties <coughs> include that the district can be determined to be ineligible for competitive state grants. And also, the state can direct the chief financial officer to, to withhold general revenue funds from a school district until they have come into sufficient compliance or put a plan in place. So Title IX compliance is a really serious matter, and it could have a huge impact on a public school district in this state uh, if we don't comply. Now, for those of you that have, have been coaching for a long time in our district, you'll remember that back in the early 2000s, we actually had a federal Title IX lawsuit brought against the school district. That federal lawsuit resulted in a settlement agreement that we negotiated over a lengthy period of time. The settlement agreement contained both requirements that would be done district-wide and things that had to be done at specific schools, all related to athletics and all related to ensuring equality. I want to go over some of those elements with you this morning because that federal uh, settlement agreement is still valid today and we still need to be sure at your schools and with all of your athletic teams that we're in compliance with these standards. Uh, and if you're new to coaching, you wouldn't be aware of this. Uh, if you were new to the position of athletic director, you might not be aware of what you have to be looking at across all of the sports, all the teams in your school. So let me give you some real life examples of what you should be going back and being sure that at your school that you're following these standards. On, a, on the, uh, the district-wide requirement, the district agreed that uniforms for male and female sports teams would be comparable both in quality and in quantity. Uniforms for a team of one gender shall not be replaced on a more frequent basis than uniforms for a team of another gender of the same sport. So we're looking at this now sport by sport. So if you've got a boys baseball team and a girls softball team, then you need to be looking at, at from the standpoint of uniforms, you need to be looking at how you're handling that for both those teams. The same would be for boys basketball and girls basketball, any, any, any area where you've got two teams. In, in the area of uniforms, remember that I said both quality and quantity. So when we went through this federal lawsuit, we actually went across the district with a team of, of lawyers and, and other legal consultants that were involved, and we had schools in their gymnasiums lay out tables displaying every uniform they had in the school for every sport. And when I say every uniform, I mean practice uniforms, competitive play uniforms, travel uniforms, shoes, socks, t-shirts, hats, anything that had to do with clothing or uniforms, we had to lay it all out. And we literally went through and we were inspecting both the, the quality of the fabrics, the way the numbers were put onto the uniforms. Some were stitched, some were ironed on. And what we agreed is that for both male and female teams in the same sports, those quality and quantity elements had to be present. So you really need to be paying attention to that. Sometimes it, you may think, well, you know, one coach has raised a bunch of money and they're going to have three uniforms this year for that team. Well, if they do that, and that's the male team, then you better get involved and be sure you've got three uniforms for the female team. I'm not saying you have to have three, but I'm saying if you want to have three, you've got a balance set out. And if you're going to have silk stitched numbers on a jersey for one team, then the coach needs to be looking at the quality of the lettering put on the jerseys for the other team. Now keep in mind, there's not a mandate that you have to have that for male and female, but it has to be available for both, but the coach has ultimate discretion to determine whether that works for those athletes. 
but we cannot have a situation where someone would complain back to the district, look how nice that jersey is and all this team got was a t-shirt. That's what you've got to be careful about. If athletic shoes or socks are subsidized or provided to the team of one gender at a school, the district has to ensure that athletic shoes or socks are provided for a substantially equivalent number of athletes on a team of the other gender. So please remember things that to you might just seem, well, we've always done this. We've always issued athletic socks to the football team. We've also always issued athletic socks to the boys' basketball team. Well, then you need to be issuing some athletic socks to the girls' basketball team, something that they would be wearing equivalently. Um, I've already talked about the stitch lettering. The, the district also agreed we would ensure, and you need to be sure you're checking your weight rooms for this, we agreed that every weight room in this district would have dumbbell weights in the following ranges, two, three, five, eight, and 10 pounds. We also agreed that we would ensure that schedules for use of weight room facilities were provided equivalently to both female athletes and male athletes. And those have to be scheduled based upon each team's training program and it is at the discretion of the coach. It does not mean that just because one team coach chooses to go and use the training uh, weight room for these many hours that we're forcing the other gender team to go that many hours, it just means the coach has to have it available. Okay, so that's, that's not an area that if there's a three hour slot for boys basketball, the girls are required to go for three hours, they just have to have the opportunity if that coach wants them to be conditioning like that to go for three hours. Pre-game meals. We agreed as a district that if pre-game meals were provided to male athletes that except when those meals are served in a private home or elsewhere if funded only by the athletes' families, then meals of substantial equivalent quality and frequency would be provided to the same similar number of female athletes. That's important if you have pre-game meals or any kind of feeding program for your athletes. You've got to balance that between the male and female teams and ensure that they're equivalent. And if campus facilities are made available to athletes or their families to do these meals, then you've got to be sure for the other gender of that team, those same kind of facilities are made available. Doesn't mean you have to force the families or parents to do it, but they have to have the opportunity to do it if they want to do that. We agreed that softball and baseball fields would be maintained on an equivalent basis. So you need to be looking at your facilities. And if you believe that those two fields are just looking entirely different from the standpoint of maintenance and how they're being kept up, you gotta do something to balance that. Um, we agreed also that all softball teams would be allowed to solicit and display advertising in accordance with the school board's advertising policies on the perimeter fencing of their fields. When we went out years ago and, and had this lawsuit, we found that baseball fields had signs around the outfield, which has been traditional, and we look at a softball field and there was nothing. And so that's when we had to set the rule in place that you've got to give the opportunity for those softball fields to have the same advertising. Bleachers, you've got to ensure that bleachers are provided at your softball fields to adequately seat the spectators. The settlement agreement did say they can be portable and can be moved around your school or around the district at other seasons. But during the season of competition, the softball fields have to have adequate spectator seating. Uh, also, we agreed that adequate and equal sports drinks would be made available during competitive and practice times for teams of both genders. Um, now, that's what we were doing just a, a kind of district wide, so please think about those things at your campus. I'll give you an example now in the federal law settlement agreement of things, I'm not going to name the schools, but I want to give you examples of things that on different campuses had to be corrected so you can go back and check your campus today now because remember, this was back in like 2002. So something could have been put in place, you know, 10, 15 years ago that has been torn down or moved or something and you need to be sure that you see if you've got it. So if you have a player of the week program for any particular sport, you have got to ensure 
that the same sport of the other gender has an opportunity for a player of the week program. So please don't be having, you know, pep rallies and things in your school and you only announce a male player of the week for a sport. If you're gonna do that, be sure you've given the coach and the team of the other gender the opportunity to do the same thing. Um, if you have a baseball dugout and you've put really nice benches in there with seat backs on them, go check your softball dugout. Don't just have a flat bench sitting on concrete blocks in there. We, we agreed at several schools, the benches had to be replaced so that there were benches with backs in both sets of dugouts. Uh, on your softball fields, if your baseball field has a drinking fountain, foul pole lines painted and designated, distance markers on the outfield fence, go look at your softball field. Be sure you've got drinking fountains, foul poles, and markers of distances there. If you've got a flagpole standing at your baseball field, Go see if you've got a flagpole standing at your softball field. And if you're gonna play the national anthem before baseball games, be sure you're doing the same thing before a softball game. Other examples at specific schools, uh, there were issues with lockers. Some schools had lockers uh, in the boys' basketball locker room, but they had no lockers available for the girls' basketball team. If you're gonna have lockers for team sports, you've gotta be sure you've got some equivalent facilities for both. Also on softball fields, we found several places where there were really nice new windscreens put around the baseball field. Softball field had nothing like that. So windscreening is an issue. If you're gonna do it for one sport, be sure you've done it for the other. Announcers booths or press boxes. If you're gonna have a nice big fancy press box at the baseball field, You've got to have some type of announcer's booth facilities for your softball field. Um, also, regarding use of fields, at that time we found some schools where the baseball field was exclusively for the baseball team, and then the field the softball team was playing on, and this might have been more in high schools and middle schools, but the softball field was being used by four or five different groups for all kinds of things. So while the girls were having their competitive season, they didn't have exclusive use of their field for games and practices. That's important. If you're gonna let the baseball team have exclusive use of their facility, you've gotta set it up so that the girls softball team has exclusive use of theirs. Um, and then athletic class periods, I'm not sure how we do that today, but if you're gonna set up class periods for one sport, you've gotta be sure there's an opportunity for the athletes of another gender of that sport to have that same type of uh, academic classroom opportunity uh, out on the field or wherever that might be. So those are just some real life examples of things that we did in this school district some years ago to try to get the whole district balanced. And we did complete the list at every school. It took about three years. There were a lot of capital projects involved in that. Some places actually we had to build a new weight room facility or we had to build a new workout facility. All that was done, I hope it's been kept up, but I would ask you, please go back as these seasons are, are kicking in, just check your facilities. You'll typically see the obvious difference if you've got a problem, and if so, get with your AD and your school principal and try to figure out how you're gonna balance that so that we can continue to turn in our reports to the state and keep this district uh, in compliance uh, under the standards as, as we can and avoid any of those penalties. Thank you very much. Just to follow up on uh, Mr. McGinnis's comments about Title IX, in your packet, you'll have a document that will have policy uh, 37 on one side, and the other side, equal opportunities to compete. Find that document equal opportunities to compete. And while you're looking for that, just a couple of sidebar comments on Title IX and equal opportunity for our female athletes and their sports programs. How many of you are coaches of girls programs? Raise your hands. Pay careful attention. The things that he was talking about, it's on your shoulders, ladies and gentlemen to go back to your school, look at your facility, and if your eyes have been open today, you need to go see your principal and say there's some things we need to correct and there's some things that we need to address. Because trust me, 
Everybody in that girls program may be happy, but one parent and one phone call from one parent can cause great grief. And when the Title IX folks from the Office of Equal Opportunity come and visit your school in this district, they're looking for a pound of flesh. You hear me? They're not there to smile. You can give them a meal. You can give them free drinks. Uh, you can take them and give them some nice portfolio. And then they're going to want to say, let me go look at your facilities. Let me see those benches. Let me see your facility. Let me see your uniforms. Let me see your programs. Let me see your awards. Let me see what's going on with boys and girls. And if it doesn't look the same, they're going to walk away with a pound of flesh. And it's not going to feel good. So go back to your schools. Let's make things right. Athletic directors, raise your hands. Okay? Every year, our athletic directors get a form from Steve Chapman's office. And it's a compliance form that goes to these people that I was telling you are looking for a pound of flesh when they come. Okay? And what it does is reports the numbers and the percentages of boys and girls in programs. It used to be that there was only one way to show compliance, and that was the percentage of girls enrolled in your school. Listen carefully. The percentage of girls enrolled in your school. We have 45% girls enrollment at our school. Then the percentage of female athletes in your athletic program must be 45% or greater. Used to, there was a 5%, then a 3% margin of error. No longer. Now it says it's got to be equal or greater. But there's three ways that we can be in compliance. There's three prongs. Have, all of you, have I talked long enough that all of you have found that three-prong approach? All right. The first prong, and the reason we fill out these numbers, participation opportunities for males and females are substantially proportionate to their enrollment in the institution. Substantially proportionate is defined as equal to the representation of female students in the school's population, not within five percentage points as in the past. So it's difficult for schools that have large football programs at the beginning of the year and the balancing female program is a volleyball program yeah, that has many less students than the football program to balance numbers at the end of the year, okay? So with that, the Office of Equal Opportunity came up with two additional ways to be in compliance. But first, we have to generate these numbers. So the second prong, if female students underrepresented, the institution can show a history of continuing program expansion. What that means is you're adding girls flag football, you're adding girls wrestling, you're adding girls this and that and the other, and you must have added female sports for a minimum of three years for this to work. Well, that's not working for us right now, okay? But it's third prong. This third prong, let's read it. If females are underrepresented and there is no history of expansion, so if number one doesn't work and number two doesn't work, the institution can demonstrate that all interests and abilities of women are effectively accommodated. Just using student surveys will not be sufficient. So that's the policy. In italicized print, this is the way that we show and demonstrate compliance. Create a portfolio that documents all areas of female athletic programs on your campus. The portfolio may contain items such as flyers, newsletters, copies of programs, pictures, tryout posters, copies of websites, newspaper articles, school announcements, awards programs, pictures of facilities, and anything else that documents athletic programs and activities available to female athletes in your program. So all of you folks that raised your hand that say I coach a girls program at my school, Please, if you have not, if your athletic director has not been soliciting, hey, bring me stuff that shows me you got a good thing going on for girls. 
At the end of the year, am I right, coaches? I'm asking, we're wanting a portfolio that demonstrates a great program for girls at your school. They'll turn this in along with their numbers, and that way, if the Office of Equal Opportunity looks at the numbers of any of our schools and says, you know, we really need to go check that out, then when they come see Mr. Chief Steve Chapman, our equity officer, they'll have a beautiful sparkling portfolio from your school to show that investigator that we've got good things going on for our female athletes, okay? All right, I think after me, we have Mr. Steve Horton, Assistant Superintendent, that's going to come talk with us about open enrollment. Good morning, coaches. Um, hopefully you had a good informative morning, and if, I'm sure someone's already said it, but thank you for what you guys do with the kids, and if, if it's you know 50 cents an hour in terms of pay, I appreciate what you do. I was, I was a middle school coach way back in the day at Meg's girls basketball, and we were not good, but it was a lot of fun. Uh, <laughs> raise your hand if you've heard the term controlled open enrollment. All right, good, good. It's an oxymoron, isn't it? Open enrollment, but yet controlled. And so it applies to all students in Okaloosa County. Uh, and so therefore, as a subset, it applies to student athletes. Uh, the, the law was written almost a year ago, and it takes effect this fall. And so essentially what controlled open enrollment did is it took our attendance waiver process that existed in the district and it modified it some. So Oklahoma County was one of those districts that always allowed student movement from school to school. And you guys, of, of course, working with uh, Brian Humphrey and, and taking into account all the FHSA pieces of it. But student movement in Oklahoma County has kind of been a way of life. It has been something that has been determined at the school level with the principal. And sometimes a principal could approve a waiver. Sometimes a principal would not approve a waiver based on any information that they had. So the way the law is written now um, says essentially that the schools no longer have a choice as to whether or not they take a student in on a, on a waiver. The, the determining factor is, are there seats available in the school? And so we had to go through a process this past fall and this spring to develop a controlled open enrollment policy. And that is on the webpage at oklahomaschools.com. We've been through that process already this spring because as you know, kids register for school already. And so we're already setting in motion what goes uh, in place next fall. But um, we had to define a capacity at every school. So the, the law requires that. One of the big pieces about this new law too is when you grant a student what we called an, a, a, an attendance waiver in the past, um, the principal used to be able to determine at the end of that year, is that a student I want to bring back? Athlete or no, right? Well, now that's no longer the case. The law says once you accept a student in on a waiver, then that student has a right to stay at that school all the way through the highest grade level offered. So you get a kid in the sixth grade, they're locked in to the eighth grade. That helps for continuity for the kid and the family, it makes it difficult to kind of plan for growth within the school. So what happens is we had to, this spring, to define or set a capacity at every school. We went with and worked with each principal and said, how many students can this school hold? Now, that's not an exact science you can imagine because it always seems you can squeeze one more student in somewhere. Um, but we came up with those numbers and we have to create, we had to create a buffer at each school. So there were some schools where maybe on the surface it looks like there might be a little bit of room for a few more students, but because once a student gets there, they're locked in, if there happens to be a lot of growth, new housing in the area, and students in zone, because we always have to service those kids, right? So if there's, if there's a lot of that going on in the area, then we may not be able to take students in from out of that zone, even though it might look like there's a little bit of space right now. So how that relates to us is, if you're a school that has capacity, lots of available seats, then you have an open door essentially for every student who wants to apply to come to you, they're able to come in, athlete or no, right? So we had a window that it closed February 15th where we let parents apply online for their children to claim a seat in any school that had capacity. You probably know if you're at a middle school that does not have capacity, there are currently three right now that have middle school level that do not have any seats available. That's Ruckel, that's Davidson, that's Baker. So 
no student at this point in time could go to one of those three schools unless there was an extreme hardship appeal. And that would be something that would be viewed with the principal, myself, and Mr. Kutsaratis to make a determination on that. So I'm sure, sure you can imagine that if there's a parent out there whose student wants to play, you know, I'm going to make up a fictitious school, but wants to play uh, this sport at this school, and that's why they want to go to that school, and that school's already at capacity, that's not something that would be considered a hardship appeal. See what I'm saying? So the other schools right now still have available capacity. And even today, even though the February 15th window is closed, parents may go online and request, I'd like for my student to attend Lewis School beginning next fall. We simply go look and see if there are seats available at Lewis School, which there are at the moment. We reply back to the parent, you're accepted, and that's it. And so what happens is the principal because of the law, lost that individual ability to say yes or no in, in, in certain circumstances. That's now dictated by statute. Um, so I just want to make sure that you guys have an understanding of controlled open enrollment in the sense that once the school is full, and it's probably not as much of a case in middle school, but I can imagine there were some situations maybe in the past where in, the, where in June, a certain athlete comes into town, lives in a certain place, but wants to go to school over here, well, if that school is at capacity and we've already declined a lot of other students to go there because there are no seats available, that student would not be able to, while living over here, go to school over at this school. Okay? Um, just for your information right now, at the high school levels, so that you know, Fort Walton and Choctaw have some capacity. Crestview has some capacity. Niceville does not have any capacity at this time. Right? Uh, Baker does not. Laurel Hill does. So. It's a matter of, if you have an interest in looking at that or have questions, you can go to our website. It's oklusaschools.com. There's a controlled open enrollment link. You can check the policy. You can kind of see uh, the information. There's an FAQ document. But I, I speak to you guys about it from the standpoint of, even at middle school, there are probably some parents who you know, want to have their kid go over here. It now really comes down to, are there seats available at the school? And the principals of those schools know whether or not there are seats available. Okay, and I won't open up to like crazy questions or anything like that. I know there was a discussion earlier about students who might attend, say, the STEM Academy, and maybe there's been an adjustment in the FHSA that said those students could participate in sports back at their zone school. That used to be the case, but now apparently it's been changed. So if you, they go to the STEM Academy, it doesn't really matter where they live, they could participate in sports at any school. But, they, but, but you know, as long as there's a seat available, as long as there's capacity at that school. Um, and so, so that's something I know Brian Humphreys talked to you about a little bit. Okay. All right. So I don't really have anything else other than to make sure that you're aware of that policy and know if you're a school that's at capacity, if you're asked a question about it. Okay. All right. Thanks, guys.